Today's episode is sponsored by Future State Media, experts in off Amazon traffic for Amazon sellers. Future State Media will build you a custom made website to deliver sales for you on Amazon. Built to grab traffic from search engines and social media, your site can be used as a secret weapon for launching products on Amazon or just to stabilize your Amazon sales. It means you can also build an email list on autopilot. Go to futurestatemedia.com for your free guide to Google SEO for Amazon sellers today. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the 10K Collective podcast, a sub podcast of the amazing FBA family. And today we're talking about numbers, which is always important, and especially trying to figure out your profit and cash flow, which is a, an area lots and lots of us have pain with. So today we have Sergei um, Faldin of Sellerscale. Sellerscale is a managerial accounting platform that helps Amazon sellers stay on top of their financials. So let's find out more about it. First of all, Sergei, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Michael. So obviously you've got an exotic sounding name. That sounds sort of East European or Russian or whatever. So uh, yeah, that's Russian actually, yeah. Russian, yeah. So you're from Russia. And um, but I believe you're coming to us from somewhat closer to me today. Yeah, actually from uh, I live in London right now. So I, I moved uh, to London nine months ago. But yeah, I mean originally from Russia, I live in the States. I really like lived in four different countries. So <laughs> Wow, so you got a very international perspective and, and perfect yeah. English, if I may say, as well. Right. So that's really helpful, I think, because a lot of these um, software things get developed in one continent, mo mostly America, and then they have a bit of an American centric kind of feel to them. And actually, I think these days there's a much broader need across the globe for Amazon sellers. So that's really helpful to know you've got that international background. So let's plunge into the main details here. So we're talking about managerial accounting versus financial accounting. Um, right. Can you explain the difference, first of all, um, what that's all about? Yeah, so just first, I want to make a quick disclaimer. I know that there are a lot of gurus and coaches in the Amazon space who are peddling courses, including Amazon, <coughs> excuse me, accounting courses and coaching products. And most of them don't have the selling expertise and they hide this fact. So full disclosure, I'm not a seller myself. <coughs> I am a CMO of seller scale. I do sell Kindle books on Amazon. So I'm kind of familiar with Amazon. I do have e-commerce background, but I'm not a seller myself. So I'll be speaking on behalf of Seller Scale as a company. Uh, regarding financial accounting uh, and versus managerial accounting, I mean, when sellers and when entrepreneurs in general think of accounting, they typically think of financial accounting. Uh, that's the first thing that people hear. And financial accounting, from our perspective, is primarily used for external parties. For example, taxes, you have investors, lenders, different shareholders, right? So you have the income statement, you have the balance sheet, which is a snapshot of your assets and liabilities. And you have the top software products in the space, Xero and QuickBooks, right? So that's what people think when they think of the word accounting. Now, for Amazon, for Amazon sellers in particular, uh, there are two limitations of financial accounting. First, it's mainly designed for outsiders. So the statements because they're used for external stakeholders. They're quite standardized, right? So they follow uh, strict principles, strict rules, so that any counterparty can read it. So it doesn't really matter what business you're in. You're, you can be a restaurant, you can be an Amazon business, and they, they, have to be all, they, they have to all look the same, right? So this makes them not really suitable for internal decision-making. So when the managerial board, when the entrepreneur sit down, they can't look at the financial accounting statements and make their day-to-day -day decisions, right? Because they're very broad. And the second thing is they're not real time. So th these reports are usually monthly or quarterly, right? You file your taxes once a year. They're designed for periodic reporting, not for continuous reporting, which you need to make decisions. Now, you can't make decisions based only on financial accounting, but financial accounting is still essential, right? For running a business. But managerial accounting, on the other hand, uh, can be anything. So you can, it's basically used for an entrepreneur or the managers of the company to keep track of their day-to-day -day business performance. You can do it in Excel. You can use a dedicated software like SellerScale. You can do whatever you want, basically. So there are no strict guidelines. And the, 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 the main reason for managerial accounting is that it supplies the company's management with information they need to make decisions, right? So it's very actionable. And as I said, it can be anything from dedicated software to Excel to seller scale. And the benefits of managerial accounting uh, versus financial accounting is that it's real time, 
So you can look at it and it can tell you exactly what your sales are right now at this hour at 1.47 p.m. They're very Amazon specific. You can make it so because you can mend it in any way you want. And it's very actionable so you can rely on it to make decisions. Excellent. That's a nice clear um, set of um, differences really. And I guess the one thing I'm getting back is that financial accounting is number one for outsiders, number two therefore very rigid and number three, it's delayed and actually is managing for managing purposes. We want something that's very specific to our needs and is quick. Is that the main difference between, is that, is that exactly. right? Exactly. Exactly. And, and you do need both, right? So you can't, uh, what I'm saying is that you can't rely on financial accounting only to make decisions. Uh, if you're an Amazon seller, you need something to supplement it. So financial accounting is not sufficient. Yeah, agrees. And the number of people that I've seen, and I've done this myself, that have tried to manage their Amazon account via Zero or QuickBooks or, or <laughs> spreadsheets, which is even worse than uh, they quickly come to grief because they're trying to solve like, you know, it's like trying to do higher mathematics when actually you just need something very simple but accurate. And uh, there's always been I've always been pleading with people not to do that. So I'm glad to to support, you know, getting exactly. a tool out exactly. there that helps people clarify this because there's so much model and confusion out there amongst um, particularly the people in their first few thousand dollars a month in sales my experience exactly. they often come to me exactly. as coaching clients and they, their finances are just a mess so um, by the way I just wanted to thank you first of all for your candor and saying that you're not selling on Amazon although in fact you are but ebooks are a bit different physical products but yeah, exactly. but I do understand that the that Paul who founded seller scale is in fact uh, selling on Amazon himself is that correct oh uh, yeah he, he's actually um, the top 5% Amazon merchant I mean at peak he was making 500 600k per year which mm -hmm. is not huge but sufficient uh, enough for him to introduce him to the intricacies of uh, the Amazon space yeah sure so that's good to know so the software is being built by a financial expert and Amazon seller so that's just just to flag that up because I mean I, I appreciate your candor but it's important to know that it has been built by somebody who understands Amazon as well all right so let's talk about um that topic I was just touching on there that my clients do find this stuff hard I find it hard I and mean, I remember literally being in a mastermind a few years ago with some really smart Amazon sellers and one of the guys literally had a nosebleed during the latter half of the meeting because he'd been up since 4 a.m. trying to do his bookkeeping so this stuff is you know physically dangerous occasionally this is very rare by the way I don't claim this is going to happen I'm not going to bring a lawsuit against Amazon for, for nosebleeds but that's just like really, really it was a very extreme version of the stress that is caused by this stuff so why yeah, is Amazon accounting so hard well I think that we need to start with problem problem zero right uh, so I think that because Amazon is so easy to start right and actually I, I'm a podcast host myself and we had one of the guests recently and he called Amazon e-commerce and training wheels so basically you have a lot of people and entrepreneurs who enter the space and they might not even had any experience prior experience running an e-commerce or even a business before right? So you have these tens of millions of billions of dollars really running uh, and they're being operated by people who and companies who often lack tight operating procedures and financial discipline. And uh, in our experience and my experience and Paul's, uh, the most underdeveloped uh, piece of operation in the Amazon space is financial management. So many sellers don't even know what their profitability is, let alone understand the deep intricacies of the unit economics or cost structure, right? And we have a lot of uh, users who are not very technical and they thank us for creating this easy to use tool because we make it all very transparent. But really it's a big problem because sellers who aren't skilled in Excel, for instance, uh, to begin with, they have no option but to run their businesses blindly without accounting for important expenses or understanding their profit dynamics. And you can't really blame them, right? Because Amazon accounting is really, really hard. Yeah, that does make sense. And actually, yeah, uh, it's true. I and mean, I went into it with no more than basic uh, financial skills. I had quite a lot of marketing backgrounds, but like, you know, quite a few people that I guess um, have been seduced by internet marketing. But there's without being read about your area of expertise, there's less seductiveness about trying to get the bookkeeping right. And it's a hard skill. And yeah, if you haven't got a business background, it makes sense that you, what you've enabled people to do is run quite sophisticated, fast scaling businesses, but 
who have no skill <laughs> and that includes right, right, me right, right. you know I'm, I'm learning I've, I've gradually learned over the years um so what you you talked about seller scale so we ought to mention briefly you know your software although we're trying to keep this you know as useful to everybody who does or doesn't end up using seller scale but what's the main problem that you would say scale scale solves um out of these things or, or let's define a bit more precisely first what the problems are i mean okay not having many skills not being able to use excel skills what what are the problems that result from that yeah, i just realized that i didn't answer your question because you asked me what makes amazon accounting inherently difficult <laughs> so, uh, that's true yeah we ought to answer that first yeah 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 so there are five uh reasons right five big reasons so number one is you have complex selling fees and this includes everything from storage fees to fulfillment fees to refund fees they're very they're really not straightforward right so they vary by category it's hard to keep track of them especially when you have a lot of SKUs, right so you have complex fees number one which is a huge one is that amazon reports can be quite confusing right <laughs> uh you have to manipulate them with Excel, right? They're not real time. So you have to put a lot of work after you download them from Seller Central. Uh, the third one is more related to cash flow and the cash cycle. You have bi weekly payouts, right? So uh, Amazon pays you uh, twice per month, and you can't tie that cash to specific products, to marketing spend, inventory investment. So basically, you have all these things and you don't understand what influences certain parts of your cash cycle because at seller scale, we view uh, your Amazon business as an investment essentially. So you have uh, a lot of money, you, you put it uh, into manufacturing your product, right? And then you get that money back with a markup. So it's a cycle. And if that cycle is not profitable, you just end up cycling it, losing money and marketing and listing optimization, PPC, everything that so many interviews focus on, it all just amplifies the cycle. But if you don't get the cycle right, you end up losing a lot of money. So that was number three. Number four is that it's more related to uh, the e-commerce, the nature of the e-commerce business in general. You have long lead times, right? So the time between your initial capital investment in the product and the time when you get that money back, the payback period can be quite long. But again, that's the nature of any e-commerce business. And I've worked in different e-commerce businesses before. And you can really solve that by uh, looking for seeking external financing, right? And number five, uh, a big one, again, the big reason why Amazon accounting is difficult is that you have two big software companies, Zero, QuickBooks, but they're not really actionable for Amazon, right? They're not real time. They're not specialized. They're not Amazon specific. And uh, from the feature in front of the UX UI perspective, they have too many features. So they're great, but they're kind of an overkill for an Amazon business, right? So all of this is not really sufficient for holistic financial management. So at seller scale, what we do is we make all of that transparent. So you can see every part of your cash cycle through the dashboard. You have different tabs, you have inventory, unit economics, P&L expenses. You can literally see all of your expenses by clicking on the cost style on the dashboard and you have 10, 15 positions of costs, the FBA fees, the referral fees, the Amazon subscription, etc. You can select any custom time period. You can see trends. You can group products by assets, product tags, categories. And um, one thing that a lot of users thank us for is being able to customize the dashboard. So it's very individualized. So you can really see uh, in real time, uh, what products are doing well and not so well and really have your hand on pulse on your business excellent so just to summarize back then the, the reports are confusing you've got to be right. getting into excel which obviously as you said a lot of people aren't comfortable with honestly right. some people are like i've literally had a couple of clients with phds at one point two of them and you know doctorates and they they didn't know how to do excel at all uh so it was slightly surprising yeah. <laughs> uh, bi-weekly yeah the, the tying cash to particular products really critical um yeah. lead times and you know getting external financing i guess the implication of the link lead time and the external financing side uh, which is very true is that you've got to have clean books in order to exactly. satisfy a bank right so i guess that kind of pushes you back towards excel or zero doesn't it but i suppose you need to have an understanding of what's going on first <laughs> right Okay, and then yeah, lastly, the the zero and QuickBooks thing, as you said, yeah, they they are general. What did you call it? Generally accepted accounting procedures. 
GAAP principles run it. So yeah, that they're going to be pretty rigid and 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 yes, for sure the user interface. And when I use QuickBooks now, I've used Zero in the past with my Amazon, and and they're both just kind of can be a bit overwhelming. I mean, setting yeah, up a chart yeah. of accounts just takes a lot of time, and if you don't do it with your accountant it's a mess <laughs> i mean so you gotta by the way um, and i just wanted to say right here right now that i do not personally feel and i'm being interested to get your view that that something like seller scale or the other sort of products like this is a substitute for having um properly managed quickbooks or zero and an accountant would you agree with absolutely that not. absolutely not i mean uh you don't really have to use seller scale to do uh, everything that we're discussing right so you can really build your own managerial accounting system in excel and that's what actually paul did uh when he created seller scale so he was a seller he was selling 500k at peak he was selling a meditation pillow that was one of his first products and uh the problem with his meditation pillow was that uh, he did not differentiate enough uh, he had really low uh, pricing power and a lot of competition. So his unit economics were actually losing him money. This cash cycle was losing him money. And he didn't uh, realize that uh, until it was too late and he was basically out of business. So that taught him a valuable lesson, uh, which is it's better to do it's uh, cheaper to do due diligence ahead of time, right? So he created this Excel spreadsheet, which he shared through the Facebook FBA. I think it was ama amazing. Amazon FBA Heroes community. Yeah, I think it was Amazon FBA Heroes community. So he shared the Excel and he got a lot of feedback. And based on that feedback, he built uh, Seller Scale. But as you say, Michael, uh, I don't believe that Seller Scale uh, is, uh, I mean, you use seller scale for managerial accounting, but still have a bookkeeper to keep your books clean. Because I mean, that's managerial accounting, but you also need financial accounting to have your books clean and to send reports to external st stakeholders, right? Yeah. That does uh, make a lot of sense. And I think that um, there's, as you said, there are different things right at the beginning. There's, it's not like financial accounting is not important. But um, I yeah, I, I like uh, Paul's story, by the way, that the fact that he started off um, selling a product at a loss and wasn't really aware of it. And then he went through the phase of doing Excel and then shared that and then created a software that's sort of hardwired the Excel. That's um that's a good example of somebody responding to the actual need and there's right. nothing more than your own need to go what's going on in my business so very interesting so what are the other things that go on in businesses then you talked about that the problem that, that seller sales solves is the transparency issue so in other words finding what's going on you know if cause and effect relationships you know my product is underpriced because if it's not differentiated and that leads to this kind of cash flow or um you know be able to group things what is it that's hidden in Amazon that we're not even seeing most of the time. So it's one thing to be making a bit less money than you thought you were, which a right. lot of us discover when you start doing your books properly. It's a sad but important discovery. And the second thing is then one of the reasons for that is hidden fees. So what are you finding about hidden fees? That What are examples of things that are hidden? Well, I mean, this is a discussion up about unit economics, right? And you said there's a big problem that people don't understand their profitability, but unit economics is a killer. I mean, I think that seller scale is the only tool on the market uh, that has this feature, unit economics. So uh, most sellers use tools like Jungle Scout to estimate demand, right? But very few sellers we find dig into their unit economics and these fees that you mentioned. And unit economics essentially is a fundamental building blocks of any business, right? So it shows your average per unit profitability, cost, revenue, and we'll share the Excel spreadsheet of unit economics uh, that Paul made for himself in the show notes. Um, an example of that, uh, we actually had one of our first users, uh, a seller, seller scale first user. He manages his own account as well as accounts for seller scale. So one of his clients was selling $40,000 per month in revenue. So it was a big account. But it wasn't until they plugged in the numbers in seller scale that they realized they were actually losing money. So the client was very happy. He was making 40K per month. But when he plugged in his numbers, he realized that he was losing money because unit economics didn't add up. The storage fees were high. The advertising didn't build the rank as they thought it would. So the ACOS was high. The percentage of PPC sales was high. The margins were low. And they didn't know that. Uh, I guess... Another example, which I recently discussed on our podcast, is men's shoes. So I had a guest, he was in uh, men's apparel, right? So men's shoes, you have sizes 7 to 15 US of men's shoes, right? But you sell most of them 9 to 11. But those bigger shoes, 
the one that people buy from you rarely, they sit in the warehouse and they accumulate fees, storage fees. And because they're a different size category, you have a different Amazon fee structure, right? And if you don't dig into your unit economics, if you don't see it in front of you, you end up losing a lot of money on the larger shoes that you don't sell, but they just sit in the warehouse. You don't understand that. So I think that you can use unit economics mainly in two ways. And I mean, we allow sellers to use them in two ways. One is you understand your current per unit profitability, which is important. So you don't end up like one of our uh, client's client, right? And the second is you model out profitability of future products. So in seller scale, we actually have a free Chrome extension. You don't have to be our user. You don't have to register or anything. You can just download this free Chrome extension. You can track products on Amazon and they then you can add them to your basket and then they appear in your seller scale dashboard if you decide to go with us. So you really need to model out profitability and sensitivity analysis and you need to play with numbers before you decide to uh, invest in a product because your product is an investment, right? We always say that Amazon is a cash cycle. It's an investment. Your product is an investment. Are you getting any return on your investment, right? You need to know that. You definitely need to know that. Yeah, for sure. So um, just as a recap, um, yeah, first of all, somebody making $40,000 a month. I mean, yeah, making is an interesting word, isn't it? Because what it means is it's going through your business, but not necessarily you that's exactly. catching it. It's it's Amazon that's keeping it. And the men's shoes thing is a very interesting example because actually variations or variation-like situations, say if you've got a product line of, of quite different products, they may or may not be variations in the strict Amazon sense. But they can often soak up a lot of cash because, yeah, they, they're going to move at different speeds. And quite often offering a huge variety will, you know, have more happy customers but you've got to decide at some point whether some customers aren't worth serving for example you know fifth size 15 shoes i don't know what that is in the in british size but size 15 yeah, is no, massive in uk size <laughs> that I, there's probably like one person in a thousand that would wear that so you almost certainly yeah. unless you specialize in that and make a big feature of that and price accordingly as well then you know that your business is broken and that's a very important point you've just put on because i think a lot of people add um they have their marketer head on and um this is one of the problems isn't it that you need to have multiple hats that you can wear as an amazon seller when you first start a business because with a market you go well i'm going to get more sales so the salesman in you goes oh more revenue good and the marketer says oh more customers more happy people good but the the accountant in you should be crying in the corner because it's going to be making you a massive loss so I think in the end, you, you've touched on something that I think is a more profound thing that people need to be aware of, which you touched on earlier, which is if you're coming into Amazon um, and it's like e-commerce with training wheels on, I agree, because Amazon gets you a lot of traffic and most off Amazon marketers have to learn to do traffic. They get you incredible conversion rates. And again, most people have to sweat to make their um, storefront or their store if they're using Shopify, Magento, really beautiful and trustworthy, build trust in whatever way they can you know, social proof, whatever. Amazon's done all that work for you, but the, in the end, you still have to learn the skills and you have to be able to, to develop, I would say four or five skill sets, marketing, um, product development, which is huge, product sourcing, which is kind of linked, but not the same thing, and uh, financial management, right? And not to say also to a degree, HR and, and communication skills as you grow a business, right? So I think you just put your finger on the fact that it's very easy to neglect the financial side with your marketing hat on so anyway that's that's my rather long-winded response to that <laughs> so <laughs> let's talk no, I, about i totally agree i totally agree yeah. because all, all of the things that you mentioned again as i said they just amplify and they speed up your cycle but if your amazon cash cycle is uh not working at, at, at the fundamental level then you just end up losing money and you run out of business yeah, and you, you, I suppose it amplifies the speed and the size of the failure as well because um, Bill Gates said something like um, if you add uh, technology or people to a clear working process, it amplifies that you know good process and if you add technology to a mess it amplifies the mess and i guess you know uh, <laughs> yeah. if you're losing money selling one unit um then you're going to lose more money selling a thousand in months right so i'm um, joking apart that is actually what happens it's, it reminds you also that that old myth of the sorcerer's apprentice you know that, that the sorcerer goes out one day and the apprentice tries to use some magic spells to clean the 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 uh, whatever studio quicker and of course um it gets really out of hand and everything just goes fast into complete chaos as opposed to just you know a little bit of chaos so <laughs> um 
that's the last thing we want so coming back then to capturing those fees then um what, what is the problem with that and how do we solve that because there are quite a lot of fees that people aren't aware of like storage costs for example right so um i mean it Again, these fees just do add up, right? And uh, b because there's so many moving parts, you just have to see them all. And again, I mean, in seller scale, we make it super transparent. You have 15 positions of fees. Uh, and if you if we're talking about unit economics, right? Uh, so you have five fundamental unit economics metrics. You have the daily unit sales, the number of uh, the number of units you sell per day. You have the average order value and you basically calculated this metric by dividing total revenue by daily unit sales. You have the ACOS, which most um, listeners might be familiar with. You have the FBA fee, which is a fee, and in unit economics, we, this is a fee that Amazon will charge you to fulfill a single unit of product to your customer, right? So this includes handling, return shipping, and uh, you can estimate the fee using Amazon built-in revenue calendar, but uh, calculator, I mean, but we do have it in seller scale. And then you have the unit landed, unit landed cost, which is your total cost of making, packaging, and sending your products to the Amazon Fulfillment Center. So uh, if your supplier quoted you a total of 2K, to produce 1K units of shipping, your total unit landing cost is gonna be $1, right? So uh, to answer your question about fees, I just think that it's really important to have them in front of you and just to see uh, how they add up depending on the product, depending on the product category. And the more you do that, so the best thing with unit economics and with all different metrics, the more you do that for future products and for your existing products, uh, the more your financial intuition grows, right? So that's how it was for Paul. That's how it was for most of our users. They play with these assumptions. They change, uh, I, I don't know. For example, you want to say, how will a $1 discount from a supplier affect your margins, right? So you make your unit line of cost to $1 less, and you see your margins go up by, let's say, 5%. Your ROI goes up. Your payback period goes down, right? So you play with these assumptions. You see how they affect profitability. You improve your understanding of financials and your intuition grows, as I said, and you can make better decisions going forward. And when you see these fees, these uh, different metrics in front of you, they just kind of become a part of your, I don't know, entrepreneurial nature or somewhat. <laughs> I know, I like what you're saying there because I think you're right that there's... Um... How can I put it? If you're building a, a business model and you want to have either homemade or you import, you know, use a third party tool like yourselves, for example, with financial management, you might think that you're just solving the problem of what your business needs to do. But actually, it goes the other way back because what you're by building something in your business, by getting, making your business better, that makes you a better uh, business owner because then you understand what's going on in the market better so um, exactly. I think that's yeah that's a very important point you've made there I think sometimes going through a painful manual process with this stuff can be important um, because then you understand really how Amazon works but also I think you shouldn't spend very much of your time doing that particularly if you discover like most of us that you're not very good at it because um, if there's an existing solution for that, it costs a few, you know, tens of bucks a month. That's probably a way, way better use of your money than spending your time on something which has been a problem that's been solved already. So, um, but it, in a way, in the end, um, what you can't do is um, that there's that phrase, um, delegate, don't abdicate. And that's true with people, but people will normally give you feedback if that's happening. Whereas software, you can also kind of plug a piece of software and think, oh, I've dealt with that now, and then take your eye off it. So once you've got something like Sellerscale or whatever software you're using, what would you say are the important things that you still need to keep an eye on? Well, I think that, as you mentioned, you still need to do your financial accounting, right? So Sellerscale is all about managerial accounting, but you still need to have a bookkeeper and you still need to make these reports to pay your taxes and whatnot. Uh, I also still think that uh, you need to keep an eye on your marketing because that's what amplifies your business and your cash cycle, right? Uh, I mean, at seller scale, we make the Pareto principle, right? You have 20% of the results influenced by 80, uh, I mean, 80% of the results influenced by 20% of inputs, right? So if Amazon is a cash generation machine, uh, if it's a cash cycle, so that's the 80%, uh, all the other aspects, product, develop, product development, marketing, that's the 20% that 
we don't touch, right? Seller scale is not about that. So uh, when you get your 80% right, when you get your cash cycle right through seller scale or your own uh, software or your own Excel table that you use for managerial accounting, you need to focus on the 20% to amplify that cash cycle. So yeah, I would say that. And uh, one thing I didn't touch about unit economics, uh, which I spoke of earlier, I think that understanding your unit economics and performing this sensitivity analysis really gives you an edge as a seller. Because again, because Amazon is so easy to enter because the barriers to enter are so low. Uh, you have all these sellers from various backgrounds, not necessarily financial or entrepreneurial backgrounds entering the space, and they're not good with numbers. If you know your numbers, if you understand your profitability on a per unit basis, it gives you a competitive advantage. I think that's really important. Completely, yes, because what happened otherwise is that you get a lot of markets where um, people are basically selling at a loss but don't realize so they're going to go out of business quite soon uh, or at least they're going to stop selling that particular product line and if you know that then you can make sure if your own economics are solid at a certain price point then you can outlast some of those guys although it does come down to a, a product design slash marketing piece as well which is differentiation right if you're not differentiated on amazon even if your unit economics look good now, I don't think they will in six months' time because somebody will have copied Absolutely. you. So, but I think in the end, what what I was come down to, and this is why I launched the new podcast, just to put a plug for that in there, the the e-commerce leader, where I'm working with Jason Miles, who's got a bigger picture sort of view. He's got an MBA and works in a corporate. He's also run his own Shopify store, you know, online business for twelve years now, and um, been coaching a lot of people in in that for years. So, and what that gives you is in the end, um, each function with your business from traditionally if you look at an org chart you'd have the ceo then coo so chief operations officer of which the financial department would be critical you know financial measuring which is what we're talking about here accounting and bookkeeping um and then you've got the marketing you got the product dev you've got the you know product development you've got the sourcing side if they all work together and understand each other's positions then that's when i think you really start to build a really strong business and i think what you've touched on in a couple of places is how some marketing and selling type driven decisions without examining the effects of that on the marketing on the accounting i should say could just lead you to speed up a disaster <laughs> rather than right. speed up a success right I mean, and i think uh, that's a very important point that you've made there right and it's actually not only unit economics because uh, i just want to touch a little bit on about overhead expenses please so, do yes uh, that's another yeah. thing that's under talked about yeah yeah absolutely so you, you focus too much on your <clears throat> excuse me, product profitability, but you forget about your other expenses, right? Your marketing costs, your rent, your office, your software subscriptions. And actually a funny thing, we have an expense tile in seller scale and we even track seller scale subscription automatically for our users. Um, the education materials and just other miscellaneous expenses that you have, right? So, and, and I think that it's, it all comes down to the fact that our minds and the entrepreneurial mind is actually wired finally when something requires too much thinking and keeping track of, we rationalize our way out of it, right? So uh, your overhead expenses might seem insignificant, but I just think that you, you want to be systematic and really data-driven about your business to the most extent possible. You're never going to be totally data-driven, right? But you want to get close to that. Uh, so yeah, I think that ignoring your overhead expenses is a common pitfall among Amazon sellers. Totally, yes. I agree with that entirely because people somehow don't count that as real expenses. It's like uh, they don't kind yeah. of see that as their Amazon expenses. But for example, I was talking to uh, a couple of, well, a couple of guys. There's a whole heap of people that seem to be involved in some kind of loose business partnership who are considering basically becoming my client in the sense that three of them will work with me. It's a bit messy looking, I have to say. <laughs> From the coaching point of view, I'm thinking, well, you know, on the one hand, they need my help. And on the other hand, it's a bit messy. But one of the things that struck me that they said the other day, I said, okay, so you need to think about your overheads, including, you know, your training costs, including my consulting fees. And they said, oh, well, that's a separate expense. And I thought, well, where are you going to put that in a, a spreadsheet or you know right, a zero right. cookbooks i would put that as an overhead and i would put that under training and that's a an allowable taxable expense you know tax tax deductible expense i should say um you just got to account for everything that, that ascribed to your business surely i mean uh, i agree that's that's often overlooked and that actually is 
Uh, another way of flipping it on its head is to say how much gross profit, assuming that you've got your unit economics right, you think, wow, you know, got that sweat done. I'm like, okay, how much gross profit do you need from that part of the business to cover your overhead? Because that's just your break-even point for your business, and that's a really ignored number. In fact, I Absolutely. rarely hear anyone discuss that, right? What are your thoughts around that? How does, does Seller Scale try and address that in some way? Uh, I mean, yeah, we have the P&L. We have the overhead expenses tile. So actually, I think that one of the big things for an Amazon seller is as well as ignoring your overhead expenses is mismanaging cash flow, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, for sure. yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, which will kill your business, by the way. It's not for absolutely. any established. If you've been in business two or three years, you probably got this sorted. I mean, this is like the first 12 months because you, yeah, you, you can't do that for long. But you're right. It is a big problem for, for new sellers. Because in, in retail, I mean, cash equals business, right? So uh, what Paul has, we don't yet have a cash flow calendar in seller scale, which we'll add soon. But again, we'll share the Excel with the audience, uh, which Paul used for his business. So you want to have a week to week cash calendar, right? So just to understand what decisions you might make to make sure you don't run out of cash, right? So for example, if you have different SKUs, you might want to actually increase price on one product so that you slow down the sales velocity, right? So you really wanna understand your cash bottlenecks. And we actually had uh, one of the guests uh, on our podcast from Nimble Seller, uh, they have a business, they have a Singapore based startup. They buy inventory from an Amazon seller uh, for, for, from a supplier. Right. And they sell it back to an Amazon seller. So as a result, they want to make e-commerce completely capital free for entrepreneurs. So cash flow is a real problem, especially for new Amazon, uh, entrepreneurs. If you don't have any money to start off with, you can't start a business. Right. And it's really easy to run out of money if you mismanage it. Right. That's certainly true. I mean, a lot of people sadly get to that point quite quickly. Um, right. So what would you say are the most neglected overheads then or, or the things that you bring to light with seller scale and people go, oh, wow, I hadn't thought of that? Well, I mean, as I mentioned, I think that uh, with seller scale, we mostly bring to, uh, to light unit economics. So uh, really, we have a lot of stories of our sellers that didn't know how profitable they were be- before they uh, plugged the numbers in seller scale. And uh, I think this is a big one for future products. So you have, you have a product and you found a product and you, and you think, yay, this is a great product. It sells great. It doesn't have a lot of competition, but then you run it through seller scale or your own Excel spreadsheet and you see that the unit economics just doesn't add up. Right. And you have to let go of that product, even though it could generate a lot of revenue, right? So that's a yeah. really big one. Uh, and I think that in general, you just have to have proper financial management with your business. And a lot of sellers, again, I mean, most of the coaches and gurus on YouTube, they focus too much on PPC and they focus too much on listing optimization. But if you don't have proper financial management, it can really kill your business. There's actually, um, I don't know whether you saw it, it's, there's an episode from South Park the three phase business plan phase one collect underpants phase three profit phase two question mark so yeah. and i mean amazon is yeah i mean amazon is not a black box right you know the variables that influence your cash cycle you know what defines your profits or at least you can see that that through excel or any managerial accounting software platform you use so we try to make all of these levers transparent right to shed light on them so that you can make your decisions and make them uh as most data driven as possible absolutely yeah and when when you have good financial management you are crystal clear on all of your profitability across all your product lines including potential products you track all and understand your hidden costs and fees you have a pipeline of new products coming up you understand their unit economics You understand your advertising metrics, which is super important, right? Because your ACOS uh, and your percentage of PPC generated sales, actually uh, that's one of the uh, most popular feature on seller scale that a lot of users thank us for is we have it really simple. We break down PPC sales versus organic sales. So you can see what influenced, what what marketing spend influenced your product boost. Uh, You can see the impact on profits and margins, right? Through your advertising. And you should always 
treat your advertising as an investment to build sales rank, right? To build sales history. And uh, another important thing is you have to be in control of your inventory and your inventory dynamics, which we did discuss, which I can go in. Sure. Well, yeah, let's talk uh, quickly about inventory, but uh, we ought to wrap fairly soon so that people can get their heads around this because uh, talking about finance, I always feel like people have to work extra hard yeah. in many cases. <laughs> but you're right. Let's talk about inventory management because obviously it's critical. You put cash in, you turn it into stock, and right. then how quickly you manage, you, you sell that stock um, is is the classic thing. So look, my, my understanding of stock management and what I see again and again is there are only two problems. One is over-ordering and one is under ordering, in other words, you're out of stock. So how Absolutely. do you deal with those problems? And, and I love that you mentioned it because uh, for us, uh, and we discuss this a lot internally in the company, inventory management is a game of balancing stockouts and excess inventory, right? So you want to be lean, but you want to have this balance. So um, some of the things that you want to keep track of is just monitor how many units you have in stock, right? Just and, and at scale, we'll have a separate tile and you see how many units you have in stock, we fetch that from your Seller Central uh, system. You want to calculate your sales velocity, so you want to see how fast you're turning that inventory up. You also want to know your lead time, so you want to know how long it takes uh, to deliver a batch of products. And you want to understand, I think the important thing is you want to understand your reorder point, when you should reorder inventory, and we calculate that based on the velocity. Right. And the last one is uh, quite popular days of inventory, which is, as it says, just how many days you have of, of inventory on hand. So you want to keep track of these five things. So again, at Seller Scale, we automatically pull all this data from Seller Central. You can, you have an additional column that says additional inventory, which you can add if you have any inventory from other warehouses, right? If you, if you for some reason, might not be using FBA warehouse as your only warehouse. And we also have a safety buffer, which is a percentage that you can adjust. But again, you, you don't want to have it too big because if you have that, you have a lot of excess inventory, which you can't get rid of. And that's basically a liability just lying there. Yeah, and one of the, uh, th those are great metrics, by the way. But uh, one of the things that also strikes me is this, that you need to account in your economics uh, planning for the fact that you will be overstocked sometimes. And uh, right. equally, if you're projecting forward, you know, your sales based on 365 days a year of sales, right. um, two things. Number one, you've got to account for seasonality. Never mind, you, nobody can account for COVID-19 or 9-11 or whatever other strange events happen you know if you're in japan which is a big amazon marketplace you know that they have tsunamis they have earthquakes goodness knows what but you can't account for that but even if you just accounted for christmas and new year and you know if you're selling a product that sells crazy just before the holidays and nothing in january that's one thing but the other thing is you've got to account for the fact that you are not going to be selling 365 days a year because you'll run out of stock at some point. And that's the first thing. And the sales side. And then on the cash flow side, you've got to account for the fact that a certain percentage of your stock is going to sit there because you are going to overorder some stuff because nobody's going to get it perfect, right? And you can look back. If you've got a big enough, consistent enough business, you can look back at the historical numbers. Um, but uh, that's another thing that's going to tie your cash up. And I think you just got to allow for the fact that you will not be perfect. And that's that's the other thing I see is that, that business models that even on paper only work if everything works perfectly. That, that's that not happens. very robust, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that never happens. And again, uh, you want to be as data driven as possible. And Paul is really pushing our company to help sellers be very data driven. But yeah. uh, you can never be fully data driven. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. And I would, yeah. What I would say, I mean, I suppose that just on that top, just topic to sort of wrap it up on inventory, uh, do you have sorts of rules of thumb of the sort of averages amongst your users of sort of overstock, how much inventory is tied up for, say, more than six months or anything like that? Uh, I don't think I can comment on that. No, no that's fair enough. I mean, that would yeah. be a pretty hard thing to get. But I, I do think, yeah, yeah, you've got to get, even if you've got an industry standard number that you plugged in, that you would just say, okay, on average, people are in stock, you know, about 300 days a year in their best sellers. On average, people tend to, you know, have stock that sits around for more than six months in, you know, 5% of cases, 10%. You know, some number like that, just to kind of plug it in to account for, the fact that we get it wrong. <laughs> I, I, by the way, I don't know how you do that exactly, but it does strike me that, you know, maybe that's a little bit too sophisticated, but you've got to have a margin where you, you just, 
know that you're going to be wrong and your business will still survive. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's what, why we have the safety buffer, right? I mean, yeah. it, it's usually, it should be about 10%. It's usually around 10% for most of, of our users. But yeah. again, you don't want to have it too high because then you have a lot of excess inventory. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, and you know what we've touched on there is the unsolvable equation. I mean, everyone's always asking me now how exactly how much time I had a, a person. I'm doing a bit of management of their their account, pretty small. Um, the other day, he was saying, "Okay, so how much stock should we order?" I said, "Well, the truth is, I cannot tell you. Um, I can give you an approximation, but you will over order or under order. So just make your peace with that, and then make make a decision. Let's make a decision between us that won't take you out of business if it's wrong either way. You know, and that's the yeah, critical yeah. thing, right?" But what, what one thing you can do though is, uh, and we had Orion Avedon. I don't know whether you're familiar with her. C uh, come to our podcast recently. She talked about lean inventory management. So one thing you can do is you can shorten your lead times. So you can mm. negotiate with suppliers to have just shorter lead times. And I don't know if if you commit to a certain number of products per year, you can break that down into smaller batches, right? And so that you don't take a lot of risk. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing you can do is, I mean, uh, this is from the cash flow perspective, mm -hmm. but if you have, uh, I mean, a, a lot of suppliers basically use sellers to finance themselves, right? So uh, when you, when you have a hundred hundred percent prepayment, that almost never happens, right? Especially for experienced sellers, but for new sellers, it happens quite often. Uh, you're basically financing your supplier. You don't want to do that. So you want to negotiate uh, and the industry standard, I think it's like 30, 70, right? So you have 30% upfront payment and 70% uh, you pay when the, it's delivered to your freight forwarder. But yeah, I mean, you want to do that. You want to shorten your lead times and you want to negotiate with your supplier, negotiate the terms because you are in the same business. So basically you're partners and you have to be very transparent about that. So I think that's important as well. I'd agree with that. Well, like inventory management, that, I mean, there are people that literally do degrees in that, you know, so it's university Absolutely, level yeah. stuff and so it's hard, but I think you touched on some really good basics there. Um, so just wrapping this up in a bow then, I think we got some nice um, free resources that you guys are offering. So just tell us um, what you guys are offering and we can send people to uh, a URL, which I'll give in a second. Yeah, absolutely. So we have two spreadsheets, two Excel spreadsheets that Paul used before he created Seller Scale. We don't yet have a cash flow calendar built in Seller Scale, but we're sharing an Excel spreadsheet uh, with a week to week cash flow calendar, which you can use and just plug in your numbers there. Uh, we also have the unit economics model, uh, which we have in Seller Scale, but it's also a spreadsheet which is which has a lot of formulas built in, which you can use to perform sensitivity analysis and ask yourselves questions such as what would happen if I create a 50% discount for two days on my product? How would that influence your profitability, your margins, right? So you can just see that there, uh, those two spreadsheets. And we also have an ebook, which Paul, as the founder of Seller Scale, wrote himself. It's a 10 page ebook on mastering your Amazon financials. It covers uh, the five most common financial pitfalls and it talks just in general how you can keep your financials lean and tidy. Uh, so yeah, we have three resources that we'll share with you guys. Amazing. Well, that's very generous. And you can get those guys at amazingfba.com forward slash seller scale, S-E-L-L-E-R-S-C-A-L-E. -E. Um, and also, if you, after all this, you like the sound of the software, um, I think we've got a deal for Amazing FBA um, and 10K Collective listeners. So what is it, uh, Sergey, that the, the deal is? Yeah, absolutely. So we're giving away a 14 day free trial, no credit card required and a 75% discount for amazing FBA listeners. So that would be amazing FBI FBA 752. That's discount code amazing FBA 752. You could just plug it in in a seller scale and you have your 75 discount for the first two months because we're a new startup. We're a three, four month old startup. Uh, we have we have a lot of better users coming in, so we would really appreciate if you guys could test it out and just let us know what you think. Great. And by the way, this is folks listening. That it's always when you get the best deals out of people is when they've just started something because they're keen <laughs> exactly. to get your custom. Right. <laughs> Later on, they're going to raise the price. So this is always the time to try stuff out. And if you've got a free trial with no credit card, there's not much risk. You can take it out. And I always feel the same as well. Um, I would always say educate yourself. If you're going to look at different software, different people's ways of seeing the world, 
then without confusing yourself and overwhelming yourself, you should educate yourself by checking them out. And they may or may not end up being for you, but you'll learn something. The way a software is put together tells you a lot about how the person who put it together sees the world financially. And, and Paul's obviously got the right way of seeing the world. A lot of things are interesting, particularly the sensitivity analysis as being essential of that model. I think that's really important because it's amazing when you work out the economics over the course of a year, what difference it makes if you take, you know, 50 cents off the cost of a unit or something. It just blows your mind how much more cash you may need if you change that. Um, it's, it's quite extraordinary. So uh, that's a really important piece. So just remains for me to say um, many, many thanks, Sergei, for coming on. Uh, a really important topic. I think you've shed light on a lot of things, a lot of problems and also some, you know, best practices that a lot of people really won't take them that much work to implement if they use a tool like seller scale so thank you very very much for coming on thanks a lot michael thanks a lot for having me my pleasure